Good morning. I welcome you to the Congregational Church of Booth Bay Harbor. I'm Reverend Todd Weir, and I invite you to listen to the prelude as we begin our service this morning. Friends, welcome again to the Congregational Church of Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter whom you love, you are welcome here. Whether you're a believer, a questioner, or a questioning believer, all are welcome to worship this morning. This is our first Sunday of Lent. Uh, we had an Ash Wednesday implementation of ashes uh, on Wednesday morning, and we had a prayer vigil for peace for Ukraine on Wednesday evening. And, and I found that beginning of Lent to be very moving, especially because as, as we were praying on Wednesday night, we were uniting together with thousands of Christians and really thousands of people who were all praying at the same time for peace. And, and that hope, hope against hope, as we think of so many people who are um, living in the face of war right now. And what also really struck me, there were about 15 of us who were praying together, and more than half had some fairly direct connection to Ukraine. Several of our members are in contact with people who are on the border of Romania and other places who are trying to help refugees. Some of our folks have lived in the Ukraine and traveled or have had um, family members come from Ukraine. There were so many connections and it reminded me that we're affected by this than more than just you know prices at the gas pump. We're, we're very interconnected in our world. And news of this war is so prevalent. You might have missed that there were major floods in Australia and a uh, major report came out on climate change saying that we're really not making the kind of difference that we need to make. And I have to say, news is such a downer, isn't it? You, know, you want to kind of tune it out. And that's why we need Lent. This is what 
Lent is for. We need this time of reflection to think through how do we, what makes for change? Where is God in the midst of this? You know, we can't change what we can't face. And Lent helps us face things squarely and honestly with God's help. We need a collective human 12-step program. And Lent is step four. Make a fearless moral inventory. That's where we are, the courage to make that moral inventory. And, and to me, you know, it sounds hard, but it's hopeful. When we go through this season of self-examination and reflection, it means we believe we can change. We believe humanity can change and move in a new direction, and that's why we do this. With God's help, we can find reason to hope in the midst of grief and fear and injustice. So Lent is this invitation to seek wholeness together. So one thing we'll be doing in Lent at the beginning of our services on Sunday morning is we've added in a prayer of confession and words of assurance of grace. And so at the end of the welcome, we'll have a unison prayer of confession that will be up on your screen that we will pray together. I'll give you a few seconds of silence for your own prayers. And then I will give an assurance of grace. And after that, we're gonna sing a chorus that you know um, the chorus from Eagle's Wings. And then after that, we will um, pass the peace as we normally do together. So that's the flow of our service. Um, please see this as a time to lay down your burdens that we may come before God. And with that, I invite you um, to pray together our prayer of confession. There we go. Let us pray. Forgive us, O oh God, when we see the world through rose-colored glasses rather than it is really is, much less the way you seek it to be. Forgive us, Holy One, when we forsake lively and risky faith, calling us to be agents of change in our world for the bland conviction that all will be well. Renew us with your grace and ground us with your spirit that we might be empowered to live in word and deed as testimonies to the power of your love over the grave. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. In a moment of silence, may we each lift up our prayers to God. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Jesus came into the world not to judge us, but to save us, to heal us, to guide us, to give us wisdom and strength, and to make us whole. So hear this good news. Your sins are forgiven in Christ's name. Listen, give thanks, and live. Amen. standing if you want to turn to one another pass the peace of Christ to one another peace to all of you who are out there watching on Facebook and cable and so on may we all wave and greet everyone welcome peace of Christ be with you all welcome to our service this morning I invite you to be seated good morning <clears throat> please pray with me Make still our souls this moment 
to collect the full scope of your love for us. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of complacency and routines. Set us free from our self-imposed bonds. Fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. I want to say good morning to all the kids who are downstairs and also who might be watching uh, online. We're glad that you are here and in Sunday school this morning. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the season we're in called Lent. And you may notice one thing that's different. I have a different colored stole. You see I have purple on. We have purple up here at the communion table. And, and purple is the color that we use for the season of Lent. And if you see my stole, you'll also see it has green here. Um, it's like a, a plant and leaves kind of going up the side. And in the middle of Lent, we also think about the hope of spring coming and the greening of the earth as well um, in this season. Now, an important Bible story for the beginning of Lent is a story about Jesus where he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he's there to search himself and, and think about, is he doing the right thing and self-examination. Uh, he's there for 40 days and we call that uh, temptation. He was there to be tempted. Now that's, that's a big word. What exactly do you think temptation is? Well, maybe it's something like, you see something you really want that's not yours and maybe it belongs to your friend or you're in the store and you think nobody's looking and and you just think it's going to be okay if i take it nobody will really miss it i know it's wrong but it's going to be okay that that's what temptation is and you see how you kind of justify that it's going to be okay even though it's really wrong that that's sort of what temptation is like or you might think you know i'm gonna uh, it'd be really funny if i teased someone and if I say this, it's, people are gonna laugh, but then it actually hurts that person and it's not funny to them. And we're tempted to say something that, that we know we really shouldn't. And you might think of other things of what temptation is. So what we do during this time is we're especially mindful of just that voice that we hear sometimes that makes us less than our best self. And we ask God to help us so we can be our best selves. And I know that you have a lesson that's gonna help you think about that and learn more about Lent. So thanks for um, watching us downstairs and um, I hope you have a good Sunday school class. We're gonna go ahead with our worship now as we listen to the scripture message. I'll be reading from John 11, verse 17 through 44. When they arrived at Bethany, they were told that Lazarus had already been in his tomb for four days. Bethany was only a couple of miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish leaders had come to pay their respects and to console Martha and Mary on their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Sir, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even now, it's not too late, for I know that God will bring my brother back to life again, if you will only ask him to. Jesus told her, Your brother will come back to life again. Yes, Martha said, when everyone else does on Resurrection Day. Jesus told her, I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies like anyone else, shall live again. He is given inter eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Master, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, 
the one we have so long awaited. Then she left him and returned to Mary, and calling her aside from the mourners, told her, He is here, and he wants to see you. So Mary went to him at once. Now Jesus had stayed <clears throat> outside the village at a place where Martha had met him. When the Jewish leaders who were at the house tried to consult Mary, saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' tomb to weep, so they followed her. When Mary arrived where Jesus was, she fell down at his feet saying, Sir, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jewish leaders wailing with her, he was moved with indignation and troubled thoughts. Where is he buried, he asked them. They told him, come and see. Tears came to Jesus' eyes. They were close friends, the Jewish leader said. See how much he loved him. But some, this fellow healed a blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? And again, Jesus was moved with deep anger. Then they came to the tomb. It was a cave with a heavy stone rolled across its door. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister said, but now the smell will be terrible for he has been dead for four days. But didn't I tell you that you will see this wonderful miracle from God if you believe, Jesus asked her. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, of course, but I said it because of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came, bound up in the grave cloth, his face muscled in a head swath, and Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go.
Friends, pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight this morning. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord, and all who die, yet shall they live. I've memorized those words because I was taught to say them at the beginning of every funeral. And, and I remember who taught me, um, Reverend Beverly Edwards, and this is how it happened. I, I was a young minister, I was 26 years old, and the senior minister went away for the whole month of July. And her parting words were, everybody's healthy, everything will be fine, it's quiet in July, have a great month. Four people died in 10 days. And I had three of the most difficult funerals I've had in my entire career in those 10 days. And, and I'll never forget that first funeral. You won't forget that. <laughs> That's how I felt, exactly. It was channeling my feelings into the sound system. And now that we have your attention, so that, so that first funeral, I remember meeting um, the daughter of the woman who died. And, and she came to me and the first thing she said to me is, don't you dare make my mother look good. She was difficult. All of my siblings, we called her the white tornado. And I am the only one that's gonna show up for her from this family. So whatever you do, I don't want to rainbows. Don't turn my mother into a saint. Okay. <laughs> Turned out she went to a different church and her pastor, Beverly, had pity on me and and she showed up right before a few days before the funeral and said have you ever done a funeral and I said well this is this is my first one she says okay and she had a, a little notebook for me that she bought she Xeroxed all of her favorite funeral prayers and she put them in the notebook for me and she says here you go and make sure you start the funeral with I am the resurrection and the life says the Lord and all who believe in me though they die yet shall they live just like it is in the Book of Common Prayer. And I've never forgotten this lesson because she said that, that when you say those words, you're creating some sacred space. You're, you're opening the door to mystery at the beginning of the funeral because it's not just about how we feel. Yes, people may be grieving and, and sad, but but it's not just about that. You are the steward of the sacred mysteries of life and death at the funeral. And this is how you need to begin. And I've never forgotten that. I've said those words hundreds of times. And, and the story it comes from is our scripture lesson for this morning. And we sort of pop those words out of this long, very long, right, Peggy? Very long, complicated kind of story and I want to unpack it a little bit by thinking about it from the perspective of Mary and Martha because they stood in the same role as that woman grieving her mother and and how were they affected by all of this they were the sisters of Lazarus they were very close to Jesus Jesus frequents their home in the gospel of of John and it says Lazarus was one whom Jesus loved and and in the beginning of the chapter they send word to Jesus and they say our brother Lazarus is quite ill please come and you would think Jesus is the great healer right you think he would just get right on it and he would rush there and he would come and heal Lazarus because that's who he was He'd healed the blind man, he'd healed the lame woman, he'd healed so many people. That's what he was famous for, except he doesn't. He delays, and everybody's kind of perplexed. His own disciples are perplexed as to why he's taking his sweet time. It might be because it's near Jerusalem, and that's a dangerous place for him. But it, it creates a lot of 
distress. And one of the ways the author of the Gospel of John shows us how distressing it is, is that he has both sisters come to Jesus one, one on one, one after the other, and they both say the same thing to him. Lord, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Now, the author could have had both of them come at the same time. We could have had this conversation once. If you have to have the conversation twice with two sisters, it really means, boy, this was really, this is really a mess, Jesus. You, you should have been here. And, and you might say in the midst, of, it's, it's emphasizing their grief, maybe their anger in the face of suffering. And so you might say that Lazarus' corpse is not the only thing that stinks here. The whole story stinks from Mary and Martha's perspective at this point. And they want to make sure that Jesus gets that. So I was looking at the responses of what Jesus says to each sister, and it's different. So first, Martha comes. And... And she throws it out there. You know, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But, but maybe, I don't know, maybe there's still something you can do. You're Jesus. And, and he says to her, your brother will rise again. Now, Martha must have been reading theology today because she's very tuned in to theology of the resurrection. And she says, I know that my brother will rise again at the resurrection of the dead. That was good, orthodox, Pharisee, Jewish theology. Resurrection of the dead, there would be this great end times. Um, in other words, they, they didn't believe that your soul just went directly to heaven when you died, but there would be a great resurrection and everybody would be raised out of the graves at the end times. And in fact, that was Orthodox Christian theology at the Council of Nicaea in the third century. Um, the end of the Nicene Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life to come. So she kind of gives the, you know, she's like a good Episcopalian saying, I believe in the Father God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in the resurrection of the, she's saying the creed, basically. It's as close as a creed as Christianity had at this time. And so what does that exactly mean, right? Resurrection of the dead? I, I tend to think that, you know, we go to heaven. We, we draw some comfort of thinking that, um, you know, our relatives are, are there, they're with God, they're, their pain and suffering is over and, and they've entered into um, this relationship with Christ in heaven. That's kind of the typical way we think of it. But, for a long time in Christian history, we've had this notion of, and, and it's caused a lot of confusion. You know, medieval scholastic scholars would debate things like, well, what if your leg was amputated? And at the resurrection of the dead, like, did God catalog where your body parts were so that they could all be raised together? Or at the resurrection of the dead, which body do I get? Like, am I stuck with the body I had when I died? I'm not sure I want that one. Can I have my 21-year-old body? How does, how does this all work? If you take it literally, it can really like, be very troubling to try to figure out. So Jesus has now said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Mary still thinks that this is all about their theological conversation, right? Oh yes, I know that, that you're the Messiah and you know, there'll be a resurrection of the dead and my brother will come back then. And that's, that's sort of the end of it, right? Now, if you were Martha, would you have felt like that was good pastoral care? You know, you, your brother has just died. You're, you're sort of mad at your pastor because you wish they'd been there sooner, right? And, and you kind of want to say, Jesus, you know, we, we learned this like in pastoral care 101, when somebody's grieving, you don't start a theological conversation. That's not what people need. It's really hard to know what to say to God when we're in the midst of grief and suffering. 
I read an op-ed in the New York Times that was titled, After Great Pain, Where is God? And the author um, had several friends that were going through terrible things. One was being going through a divorce and another had tragically lost a child. And one of his best friends um, had died and he was in touch with um, the man's wife and she wrote him this email. She said, I wish I could tell you that we are walking this journey with courage and faith. But really that doesn't describe my situation at all. The outward courage I show feels like a ruse trying to convince everyone that this immense pain is gonna subside and I just feel like the weakness of my faith is eventually gonna show. And I thought about that and I thought, no one can really teach you ahead of time how to deal with immense suffering. We don't know what to do in the midst of death before we've met it. No theology can immunize us from what hits us. One of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, thought he understood death. He thought he understood grief and pain. He wrote some of the best books that are still read. And, and he wrote that we have suffering and pain in the world so that we can know about goodness, often a standard answer. He said pain is the way God breaks into our, into our lives. And he wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but God shouts to us in our pain. It is God's megaphone to a deaf world. Okay, then his wife died and everything changed. And his next book was entitled A Grief Observed. And it was the basis for the play Shadowlands that uh, came out a few years ago. And in that book he wrote, when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? The door is, it's, it's slammed in your face, it's bolted, it's double bolted. And after that, silence. And the conclusion I dread, says C.S. Lewis, is so there's not a God after all, but rather, so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourselves no more. So we bring in the second sister, Mary. She too comes to Jesus with the same words, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But then she falls at his feet and she weeps. If Jesus had said at that point, I'm the resurrection and the life, I don't think we'd want to repeat what Mary would have said. And it says that Jesus is grieved in his heart. He too is sad. Now he finally goes to the tomb and he weeps. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. It's the first Bible verse I learned and memorized as a kid, right? Jesus wept. What a powerful verse. More than any great theology of resurrection and what happens to us when we die or how, Jesus wept. He met Mary right there where she was. And he didn't try to pretty it up. He didn't say, oh, Mary, he's with God now and he's not suffering anymore. Oh, Mary, Jesus needed another angel all the things that people say that are supposed to be comforting that sometimes just don't deal with the reality of death. And he's right there with her. He doesn't even say, hang on 10 minutes, right? Stays with her in her grief. We get this complex and wonderful picture of Jesus in the Bible. 
He's a rabbi who loves theology, but he's also a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. We see him weeping for a friend. We see him weeping over injustice in Jerusalem. We hear his shout from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the Jesus in the gospels. And, and the ending of this story, it, it's complicated. It's, it's not an easy story that just sort of the meaning is self-evident, right? Because what happens at the end of the story, it's not like there's a big, oh, Lazarus is alive, we're gonna have this big party, this is really great, thank you, Jesus. No, the ending of the story is all of his opponents get together and decide to have him killed. In John's gospel, this is the reason that they want to kill Jesus, because he raised the dead. And that's gonna bring even more grief to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So I'm gonna share a complicated conclusion by telling another story. The end of the story of the funeral of the white tornado. Didn't you wanna hear that? So I'm meeting with the daughter and and I said, so tell me, how did your mom get this name? Like, what happened that you decided to call her the White Tornado? And she says, well, you remember the Ajax commercial in the 1970s? And, and Ajax, they would come and they would open up the bottle and this tornado would come out of it, like an ammonia tornado would come out and whirl around and clean up the whole house. And that's what it felt like sometimes for us kids to be around mom. She was the White tornado just always trying to like make everything clean and we had to be perfect and all of this kind of stuff and and that's what we we called her and I said well how would you feel in the eulogy if I said that you called her the white tornado and and this woman who had already told me she didn't want a pretty funeral don't put any sunshine and rainbows on my mother looks at me and she says well, I don't know if that would be appropriate. And I said, well, it's the first thing that you really told me about your mother. It, it seems to be defining. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, say bad things about her, but, but let's just maybe say it. How would that be? Okay, I'll trust you. You go with that. She gave me the green light. And, and so I um, went on with the eulogy. I um, said, yeah, the kids call her the white tornado. Most people laughed, you know, oh, you know, her friends could kind of see that. And, and so at the end of the funeral, now this, this woman um, who died had been the head librarian at a major university. Like, big job, very important. Um, person in her work world and one of her colleagues was there at the funeral and she stood up at uh, you know I always gave time for people to say a few words and this colleague stands up and she looks right at the daughter and she said oh I told uh, so funny I totally get why you kids called her the white tornado she said you know she could be really tough she was a perfectionist and she really didn't realize, I mean, her perfection hurt her, but she didn't realize that her perfectionism hurt everybody else too. But she, she cared about the truth. She cared about doing things right. She cared about books and words, and she put the love of that in me, and she pushed me and made me better. And I'm sorry it was so hard for you to be her daughter in the midst of that. And at the end of the funeral, the, the two of them got together and, and the woman came to me and she said, that was so healing. To see my mother through the eyes of a grown up and not as a child and to just speak truth, that was so healing. And I'm so glad that was my first funeral because it, it, it taught me we have to be honest in the face of death. Not mean, but just honest with the pain because that's the only way that can, we can reach the healing that we need.
by having some sacred moments that open up the space. And, and here's my final kind of word on that. I think we often live between our pain and our theology. And we can't keep them separate in different hands. If we ignore pain and grief, then our theology cannot help us. It cannot heal us. It cannot give us hope and deeper faith if we're not paying attention to the pain that's right in front of us. And on the other hand, if, if we don't pay attention to our theology in the midst of pain, then all we have is pain. What Jesus does is put it together and brings together what we suffer and what we face with our theology of hope. And that's why I keep saying, I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. And all who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Amen. Friends, go in peace. Our, um, our next hymn is uh, Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. <laughs> invite you to um, share your joys and concerns and um, uh, we're going to ask if you uh, Ella's going to come and bring the microphone around our folks who are listening in like to hear um, what you have to say and don't want to miss out so Ella will come down the middle and uh, any joys or concerns that you have this morning Kathy's right away. <laughs> I'm always a joyful person I wanted to thank you for that sermon that was amazing like it spoke to me in so many ways you have no idea um, I just wanted to say th thank you for my father-in-law he made me the most wonderful placemats <laughs> for my home and all my good friends I love all of you very much thank you anyone else thank you I, I think that's it Okay, let's pray. I, I don't know, but I'm feeling very emotional. Um, that was an important story of my life. So um, let's just have a moment of silence and we'll pray. Oh God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us. Call us forward to the resurrection and the life. We feel surrounded by a world of dry bones, dry deserts and plains. 
a world where there is death and despair, a world where sometimes we lose hope in our structures, our governments, ourselves, and even you. So we pray for this world in need of your grace and healing and for all peoples in it. We pray so desperately for people in Ukraine who are displaced from their homes and grieving so much loss, caught up in violence. We pray too for the people of Russia also going through pain and trauma that was not necessarily of their choosing. We pray for those who lay down their lives, for those who lead. O oh God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us, call us forward to the resurrection and the life. We pray for the people around us facing difficult challenges in life. We pray for those who have been struggling with addiction and are seeking a way of hope forward. We pray for all who are in the midst of grief, who are unable to see their lives past their tears. We pray for your healing presence, for those who are imprisoned, for those who are alone, for all of our members and family members who are ill or in recovery. We especially pray for Becky Welsh and for John. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for Priscilla Gillespie as she recovers at home. For all others that are recovering from surgery, we pray for caregivers and the burdens that they carry. O oh God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us, call us to the resurrection and the life. And we pray for your church throughout the world, for the courage to follow you, to work towards your new creation in us and through us. O oh God, who always listens to us, who breathed new life into us, call us forward to the resurrection and the life. We pray as Jesus taught his disciples, our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, I would like to invite you now to this communion table. Come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Come to this table not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and pray for a spirit. Come not because you are fulfilled, but because there is an empty space inside that only God can fill. Come as you are, part saint, part sinner, longing to be whole. Come that you may know that Christ walked among us, shared our common lot, and showed us the ways to walk with God. Friends, let us pray together. Holy God, our loving creator, close to us as breathing and yet distance as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life and the people of faith in every generation who have seeked to follow you. We thank you that Christ came among us, that you sent from your own being to us and we honor Christ's birth and life and death and resurrection and the calling forth of your church for its mission in the world. And we give thanks for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And in the power of the Spirit, we offer ourselves to you in this moment and praise your name for all of the work that you are doing in us as we now share this meal together. Amen. When Jesus had gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body, it is broken for you. Take it and eat as often as you do so in remembrance of me. May we share together the bread of life. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the sins of many. Take it and drink as often as you do so in remembrance of me. May we share together the cup of salvation. For our prayer, I just invite you to repeat after me. God, strengthen our faith. Increase our love for one another. And send us forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, our closing hymn is number 112, Jesus, the very thought of thee.
seated. Um, I'm actually going to fold in the offering with the announcements as we close the service. Thanks to all of you who um, pledge and who help make our mission possible. Thank you so much. You can give online or um, in the baskets that are at the exits. And I just want to let you know, we've been um, raising money for humanitarian aid to the Ukraine. And I think as of Wednesday, we already had more than $1,200 to send. And um, if you would like to give, you can just put Ukraine in the memo uh, of a check or uh, through our online giving. And we will make sure all of that money goes to the Ukraine for assistance. Um, this is the first Sunday of the month, and that's when we sing happy birthday to everyone that has a March birthday, including me. Uh, yay, March. We usually, yeah, <laughs> lots of March birthdays out there. Um, so we're going to go ahead. Usually we do that at the beginning, but somehow doing a confession, happy birthday, I thought let's just do that at the end and go out on an up note. So um, if you will lead us, Jeannie. couple of announcements before we close. Um, after our worship, we're doing a Zoom coffee hour for all of you that are watching, or if you want to run home um, at 11.30, we'll sign on. Now, the link for that is in your Wednesday email, and what you need to do is scroll to the end of the email, and it'll say link for Zoom coffee hour. If you have any trouble finding it, just email me, and I'll check before I sign on and make sure you get the link. And, and we'll just take a, a few minutes to check in, say hello, talk about what you're doing for Lent. We just thought for all of you that are watching, we want to somehow include you um, into the life of this community as well. Um, as I said earlier, we are in the beginning of Lent. We still have some of the Lenten devotionals from John Pavlovich. Um, they're out here in the hall and feel free to pick one up. If you would like one and you're watching, just uh, let us know and we will work that out. Um, you can read it on your own. We're also reading from it Monday through Thursday night at five o'clock in our evening Vespers. Any of you are welcome to drop in on uh, any of those evenings. That's all my announcements. So let me send you off with a blessing. Friends, be a blessing. Pray often. Practice peace. Lead with love and be joyful. Be kind, give thanks, do good and have courage. Work for justice, encourage others, be the light. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>